for you to check out all the stuff that's going on. We want you to be in the loop about all the cool things we have going on around here. A couple things I do want to point your attention to. Number one, the Community Families Conference is a week, less than a week away now. Um, we would love for you to register for that. The deadline is Tuesday. You can register online for the Community Families Conference. If you want some Chick-fil-A, make sure you register, because we got to make sure we have food for you when you get here. Another thing is Men's Retreat. Men's Retreat registration deadline, I believe, is today. So if you are registering for that, please fill out the pamphlet that's on the table in the foyer, turn it into the office, give it to Bob, do whatever you need to do to get registered. There's Bob raising his hands nice and high, just so you know where he is. Not that you wouldn't know where he is anyway. Um, but there he is, so make sure you get that registered. There's also a women's event coming up. There are postcards out on the table for you to check out as well. Lots of really fun things going on around here. We would love for you to be a part of. Well, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Would you stand as we begin our time of worship together? Lord, I find you in the seeking, Lord, I find you in the doubt, and to know you is to love you, and to know so little else who I
we trust you with all of the other stuff that we can carry. We believe that you know about those things. We believe that you care about them. And we know that you're working on them. So we offer all of those things to you, Jesus. Thank you for these moments that we can gather. Brothers and sisters in Christ and community. Jesus has already been there. And he calls you into those moments. And so, on this wild goose chase, we're spending a, a, a few weeks talking about what it means to live a life of holiness. Blessed, filled with, directed by, encouraged by, nudged by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to talk to you. Last week we talked about holiness as uh, perfection, what, it, what that means, what it doesn't mean. If you didn't catch that one, you can get it on our website or our YouTube channel. This week, I want to talk to you about holiness as purity. The concept of purity. Why it actually matters to us. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Ezekiel, one of the Old Testament prophets. Chapter 36 is, is where we will where we'll be. Now I want to give you just a couple sentences of a backstory of what's going on when we reach this point in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is one of the prophets to a people who have well, they haven't always been faithful in following God. God had established a covenant with his people. And God perfectly fulfills his end of the bargain, his end of the covenant. He's, he's perfect and he's faithful to fulfill his part of the covenant. The people, on the other hand, not so much. And so they're, the way they have lived, the way they have treated one another, uh, it has deviated from... God's best plan for them. They have strayed away from fulfilling their end of 
the covenant. And they have allowed other things to get between them and God. And you'll hear in the passage the word idol, the idols. Um, it's not, that doesn't mean superstars. Idols, in this case, means anything that would block, be a blockage between you and God is an idol. So even really good things can become idols if you're focusing your attention more on the good thing than you are on God. Bad things can be idols, things that distract your attention and cause you to stray away. And so the people, have their, their conduct, their idols, um, have they've broken the covenant and we're, we've reached a point that God is punishing them according to their behavior and he has scattered them and we, we say that they went, God sent them out into exile. <coughs> Local uh, the, the, their neighbors, stronger nations, have come in and decimated the land and carried them all off uh, into exile. But even, you know, sometimes there are big things, there's big moments in our lives where we feel like, maybe, maybe this is a consequence to my action. And there's moments where when we feel like maybe my life is leading me in a direction that I don't want to go and we're suffering some of those consequences, it, it provokes you to change, right? It gets your attention and you're like, man, I need to do something about this. And so we turn. You would think that the people would recognize that they have broken the covenant with God and they are suffering the consequences to their action. And so maybe that, maybe just, maybe that would be a reason that they could change their behavior and, and, and turn. But no. Wherever they went, they carried their problems with them. Wherever they went, people know them as the people of God. And, and so in the lands that they found themselves amongst the people that they were now living, they polluted the name of God even there. And they carried their idols with them into exile. And God has concerns over maintaining the purity and holiness of his name. And so we find ourselves in, the people are in exile. These are the words that the prophet Isaiah writes to them. We're going to focus mostly on verse 25 and 26, a little bit of 27 today, but I'm going to back up and we're going to read starting in verse 22. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations, and so I will bring you back from exile. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then... You will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I know whenever I bring up the idea, the concept of purity, people cringe. Like, oh no, this is going to be a guilt trip of a message. No, it's not. The concept of purity comes up over and over and over in Scripture. 
And God is concerned about his holy name. And so what I, what I want you to do is just take just a few seconds and tell your neighbor, when you hear the word pure or purity, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What are the things that you think about when you hear the word pure? Go ahead. White. Clean, white. Tom. <laughs> You're not going to get away with not having your name said on that one. Perfect, right? Holy. White. White. Yeah, there's lots of things that immediately come to mind. Now, some of those things, like I wore white pants today, and I am, I am shocked that I don't have a drip of coffee on me. <laughs> that was a risk. Um, some of those things that we named out loud, there are forces and pressures out in the world that are trying to degrade your understanding and concept of, of purity. I, I think I may have shared this story maybe a few years ago with you, but I was, we were, we had built a house in, down in Illinois and, and one of the responsibilities we had was they, they put in sod in the front yard, but we had to, we had to do, take care of the backyard ourselves. So it was just a bunch of dirt. <laughs> and we had to, you know, get grass seed and plant it. And, man, that's a lot of work. And it's hard to grow grass sometimes. Also, we went to the store, and, and I was looking at grass seed, and I noticed that some of the bags of grass seed actually have a purity rating on the back. And the particular bag that I was holding had a purity rating of 90%. So I don't know if it was Kentucky bluegrass or whatever it was, something that if it, if it came in how it looked like on the front of the package, we would have a beautiful, lush, <laughs> green lawn. But I, I carried that with me for a while, that that bag of grass seed had 10% of something else in it. Well, if it's not Kentucky bluegrass seed, what is it? What's the other 10%? Weeds! <laughs> Dandelions! Crabgrass! You know those other things? Those things that, you, that are evil and vile and you cannot dig them out of your lawn and they keep coming back, right? And here I am, I'm about to buy a bag of grass seed and I know that it's not 100% pure of what I'm trying to get. There's, I have to lower my purity expectation by 10%. And I wonder, do you, do you suppose we live life that way, too, on occasion? Little by little, we begin to lower our standards on what purity, what perfection, what, what clean actually is. And so it creeps in. You might pe hear people say, I mean, I'm sure these are things you would never think or say out loud, but you might hear people say, well, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Well, everybody's doing it. You know, it's just how the world is right now. You know, everybody bends the truth a little bit. It's only a little white lie. What's the harm in that? It's really not going to hurt anybody. It's not really a big deal. And so slowly, those sorts of phrases creep in to our minds. And, and maybe we even hear ourselves saying some of those things. And what's happening is slowly we are being desensitized to things that go directly against the known law and will of God. And we begin to tolerate sin in the world, in our life, and the longer that that goes on, we, we might even begin to think that what is sin, or what is called sin in the Bible, well, maybe it's not so much of a sin as what we've made it out to be in the past, right? Slowly over time, the purity rating, which is pretty high when you come to the Word of God, we expect less out of it. Because we're being stained and influenced 
desensitized by the world. I mean, if you just look at, sometime if you're, if you want to do a fascinating study, is there, there are reports, and, and the, the easiest one to see is if you look at the Billboard Top 100 hit songs, go back and look on a year-by-year -year basis, going back to like when they first came out, 50s, 60s, and uh, there is a rating on music, right? And so music that has explicit content has a little black box with a little white E next to the song. And the way that over time it has gradually gone from zero songs with explicit language content. If you look at the Billboard Top 100 now, I think that it's over half or more that have songs with explicit content. You have noticed in your own lifetime the change in what is acceptable in television programs and news media and all sorts of, you can see the, the decline. So for a while it was a slow decline, but recently it just has felt like it's gone off the charts, it's fallen off the cliff. Over time we've been desensitized, our purity rating has come down. And so now instead of expecting 100% purity in, in our grass seed, now we're oh, even 90%, that's, that's pretty good, that's really good. That's like an A in some places even. See, we are, we are made in God's image. And so we have this longing for, for purity wired deep within us. That's, that's how we're made. And, and we have a longing for something better than what we're experiencing in our lives and in our world right now. But the more that we, the more we suppress that, the more we come up with all of those excuses, like, you know what, just how the world is now, Pastor Dave, I can't help it. Well, you can help it. We, we can, we are called to live differently. We can live in the world, but it's, the Bible says we're not of the world, but I want to remind us we're not out of the world either. And so, we don't bubble wrap ourselves, but a Christian who is following Christ where he is going and living like him will sort of be like a repellent to these sorts of things. You, you can live differently and better than how you are living if you feel like, you know what, I, maybe, my, maybe I've dropped my expectations a little bit. So over time, we... we the longer we suppress it, the, over time, we begin to lower our expectations. Sometimes it's just unconsciously. Sometimes it just happens until we, we lose sight of God's intentions for us. And so all of our excuses and reasons for tolerating what's than God's best, that pollutes our relationship with Him. That begins to cloud our, our vision of Him. And so... If you're, if you're going to write anything down, I would, I would challenge you to write this question down. How much sin do I tolerate in life? How, how much sin do you tolerate in your life? Jesus said, uh, when he began his ministry, in the Gospel of Matthew, we get some of the backstory of, of Jesus, and then in chapter 5, Matthew, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, Matthew gives us what we call Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And, and at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes through what we call uh, the Beatitudes. He has a bunch of blessed are you statements. And the one that we find in Matthew 5, 8 is blessed are the pure in the heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will, they will what? They will, they will see. They will, they will vision. So the blessing here is vision. The blessing here is an ability, a, a knowing of God by having a, a vision of Him. A, a few weeks ago, I know it was only a few weeks ago, it was like right around... 
what was it, St. Patrick's Day, we had that big snowstorm that came through, right? And I was driving around, I think it was driving down 31. And you know, the roads weren't horrible, but there was snow on them. I don't think the plow had, maybe the plow had gone by once. Um, but there was, and it was still coming down, and there was this car in front of me that was just kind of going like this. And they were, they were not driving in a straight line. They were kind of weaving and drifting back and forth. And so as I made my way around this car, I'm like, are they okay? And so I, I looked. I, the, back win, the back window was entirely covered with snow. The side windows were entirely covered with snow. They, like, they didn't have a scraper or something. Whatever the issue was, there was no vision in from my angle in. And so I get right up alongside and I look over. Their front windshield is entirely covered with snow except for... <laughs> and I can see the person was stretching up over their steering wheel like this and they were trying to put their face up to the glass to look through the hole that was like this wide. <laughs> no wonder they were puttering along and, and not exactly knowing where they are going. Is that how your walk with the Lord feels sometimes? Like you don't have a clear vision for who He is for where he is going, for what he wants of you. And so you have, you've just scraped a little bit of ice off, off your windshield so you can make it by. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna go to church like at least once a month. And, and you know, and, and I'm, you know what, I've got, a, I've got the Bible app on my phone and if it gives me a notification in a timely fashion where I can see it, I might read that, take a few seconds to look at it. And so we have this little hole that we're trying to look through and navigate through a, a Christian life. And sometimes it just feels like we might be going really slow and we're, we're drifting a little bit. It's like your heart is clouded with sin that you have tolerated and left unaddressed and then ignored in your life. You've let, you've let those things build up and you, you know, I, I don't know what to do, to do about that. You, you don't sense a connection with God because there's something that's preventing you from seeing Him. All those other things in your life that you've let go unaddressed are like that snow that's keeping you from seeing where you're going. Your spiritual vision is impaired. Have you ever got a speck of dirt in your eye? It can be a little thing, but once it's in your eye, it's like you see nothing. Your vision is blurry, your eyes are watering. These impurities, these, these sins, these things that sometimes we ignore, they cost us. But it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to live like that. The Bible tells the story of a God who goes to great lengths to purify you, to power wash your soul so that you can see him, so that you can know him, so that you can be filled with his love and his Holy Spirit. He, he gave his son Jesus to shed his blood to purify you. That's what we've been singing about. The passage that we read in, in Ezekiel shows us two ways that we can think about purity. But the first one is that purity looks like goodness or cleanness, if you will. Uh, it's a purity that looks like being unstained. It's a, it's a, it's a purity that uh, is like morally pure in all areas of our life. God will wash us clean. The second way that, that this passage talks about purity is that it looks like simplicity. It looks like single-mindedness. And so, verse 25, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I, I, God's taking ownership. God's taking initiative. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. 
So the first way to think about purity is to recognize that God has. God is the one, God is the mover. He will cleanse you from your sin. And, and the, the, world, the, the, the word that we use here to talk about clean and cleanse that we see in, in the verse there, it's, it's exactly like what we think it means. It means too clean, to scrub something. Something was dirty, something was polluted, but there was something that acted upon it, and it was cleaned up, and the stain was removed. What wasn't pure has been washed clean. And so it's easy for us to imagine being clean from, from the outside. You know, if there's, a, if there's a, something on your floor, you wash it up. If I wear a white shirt out, and we're, if there's any red sauce, I don't know how it happens. Maybe you, you drop something on your plate and these little red splatters. Anyway, when that happens, what do you do? You take it home and you soak it and you bleach it and sometimes you got to scrub it, right? What was dirty becomes clean. If you're looking out your window at home, your, your door, and you know, it's the nice time of the year now, you can open the doors and, and you see more glass. And then maybe you see dog nose prints and little hand prints and you know and and so you, you can't see out the window so what do you, you you wash it and so now it is becoming clear that's the idea of cleaning of being cleansed so like the pharisees who jesus interacted with quite a bit we're, we're often satisfied with cleaning up the outside, Look, looking good from the outside in, because what people see of us first is our exterior, right? In, in Matthew 23, Jesus was having some interaction with scribes and Pharisees, and he's going after a, a few of the things, and one of the things that he talks about in Matthew 23, I think it's about verse 25, he says, woe, Woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Now what is he saying? He's like, he's, he's getting, he's going after them and encouraging them, no, you've got to clean the inside first. And if you clean the inside first, then the outside will also be clean. They took the opposite approach. They worked on their outward appearance. They practiced what I call situational purity. They look around, what situation am I in? What people am I with? Who's watching me right now? And they would evaluate their situation and they would Take whatever action was necessary to make themselves look good on the exterior. They washed the outside when it benefited their public image, all while missing the point and letting the sin and evil behaviors and, and thoughts rule the inside of their life. All of those things built up on the inside. They were filled really with dry rot. And Jesus is, is calling it out, like, you're just polishing the outside. And the Bible's pretty clear that how we think, what we say, how we treat one another, all comes from where? From our interior, proceeds out of the heart. And so Jesus is encouraging them to go back and be students of the word that they thought that they were masters over. He's like, no, you're, you're missing the point. It all comes from the heart. So you might want to work on having your heart cleansed first. And if that is the case, if you seek purity of, of heart, that's going to work its way out into your life. So God wants to do this work in you. He wants to do something greater in you. He, he wants to clean you from the inside out. He wants to deal with our sin. He wants to deal with all of the impurities that, that pollute us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
He wants to take away the idols that we prop up. And when there's an idol between us and God, what does it do? It blocks your vision. Right? It's not purity of heart. So there's things that get in the way of us being able to see God. And God wants to do the work of removing and scrubbing and cleansing you. First John 1 John 1.7, it reads, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus. His Son purifies us from all sin. Now back in the first century, if you went into the market and you were thinking about purchasing some cloth, one of the things that you would do when you evaluated fine linens is you would hold them up to light to reveal if there were any flaws and imperfections in the fabric that you were purchasing. And so in a similar way, we, we are to hold ourselves up like that piece of fabric to the light of God and allow His light to show us where our imperfections and our impurities and, and our sin is. And then let Him let Him cleanse you. So it's like Jesus is like the bleach that removes all of those stains from your soul. God has acted. He took the initiative. And he, he washes the wound that sin inflicts on our lives. But there's another part of it. God does that work. But there's, there are things that we do to maintain purity once he washes us clean. Peter talks about it in the form of obedience. We maintain our purity before the Lord by being obedient to Him, obeying what He says, obeying His Word. Because evidence of, of God's work in transforming the interior of our lives ought to increasingly show on the exterior of our lives in the ways that we act, in the ways that we love, in the way that we serve, in the way that we bear witness to Him in all the places where we go. It all proceeds from the interior of our heart. So the first way that we think about purity is this cleansing work that God does for us when we come to Him and we confess and we humble ourselves and we say, Lord, I, I repent of it. I confess these things. We forgive me. And He washes you clean. Verse 26 gets into talking about the second one. Ezekiel continues talking about the heart but he switches up his metaphor here. And he gets to the second kind of purity that says that your heart is pure when it is not divided. God says, I will remove their heart of stone and give them a new heart of flesh. Have you ever seen or held on to petrified wood? It's heavy, it's dense, what once was wood now feels like it's stone. And so what was once alive had living cells that was, that was vibrant, grow leaves and had life in it, gets buried under mud and volcanic ash and, and all sorts of things and it gets, it gets compressed and it gets waterlogged and over time each cell of that piece of wood is slowly replaced by minerals, and it becomes calcified, hardened, and turned into something that's really stone-like. The same thing can happen to the human heart. It may look like a heart, it may have a shape of a heart, but it has become something cold, calcified, and, and stone-like. Now, of course, when we're talking about the heart, the way that the Bible would talk about it, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, the, the, the organ that, that pumps blood all around our body. What we're talking about is the, the whole, our whole self, all of who we are, our mind, our will, 
our emotion, everything. And it's the center of our being where we decide things. Will you lie and bend the truth? Or will you, will you be honest and tell the truth? Will, will you stand up for someone who needs to be stood up for? Or will you take a step back and not speak up, not step in and help? Will you act out of your anger when somebody hurts you or says something mean about you or you know, make some obnoxious comment on Facebook or whatever social media platform it is. We we respond out of your anger in that moment, or will you respond out of love? Will you respond with with mercy. See the heart when we talk about it in a biblical sense is is what you are in the secret place of your thoughts and your feelings. When nobody knows but God. The heart is the place where you will either meet God or you will avoid meeting Him. And in our passage, in Ezekiel, when we read the Old Testament, we, we see that the hearts of the people of Israel had grown cold, complacent, stone-like. They were apathetic. They were unresponsive to the nudgings of, of, of God. They were indifferent to the things of God. They, they had the law, but they didn't practice the law. They, they knew how they were supposed to treat their neighbors, but mm, you know what? I want to treat myself better than that, and so I'm, I'm going to live for myself and not for my neighbor. They had too many distractions, all of those idols, the alluring things of the world got in the way, and so it divided those things divided their hearts, divided their loyalties, and all of those things came together to harden, to harden their hearts. So all the cares and concerns of the world, you, you could say that the opposite of a pure heart, in this sense of how we're talking about it, is a divided heart. It's, it's split, it's double-minded which describes a person who waffles back and forth between making uh, choices in the flesh, how we might prefer, and, and living in faith to God. We kind of waffle back and forth. That, that's a double-minded person. That's a person with a divided heart. And that's the opposite, in this case, of, of having a pure heart. A little bit uh, earlier in the book of Matthew, we told you about Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees in chapter 23. A few chapters before that, in chapter 19, there was a, a young, wealthy person who approached Jesus, and he wanted, his question for Jesus, what must I do to, what, inherit, to have, obtain eternal life? That was his question. Like he could buy his way in, or that he could trade some of his accumulated wealth for the blessing of, of eternal life. And Jesus says, Jesus saw through him. He, he saw that this man had a divided heart. He, he saw that he was waffling back and forth between what he really needed to do, but what he personally wanted to do. And so Jesus says this, he says, go, sell all your possessions, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. But here's, here's the, this is the part that Jesus got his attention with go sell all your stuff. Everything you've accumulated, that, that's great. But you know what? It's not getting you anywhere. It's actually like a sandbag. It, it's weighing you down. What you say that you desire, that is holding you back from it because you're focused more on that. You're focused on the, it's your idol. It's what's blocking your vision of God. So Jesus, first of all, he, he said, he gives them the prescription, go, just go get rid of all of that stuff. You're not going to see God and hold on to that because you have, your heart is divided. 
And give some of it away because it will do your soul good. Because you'll start practicing that inner purity that God will give you when, when you when you purge yourself of all the things. And, you, and you'll build treasure in heaven when you begin to, to think and act and walk and live and, and help people like this. That's the first part. But then the main part, he says, then come, follow me. You don't buy a ticket to eternity. You take steps into eternity one at a time by following me. So go do that and come back. We have a journey to go on together. Come and follow me. See, Jesus' call to come and follow it is a call to a reckless abandonment of personal ambitions. Maybe it's money for you. Maybe it's status. Maybe, you know, whatever it is for you, whatever you are working towards, because that's where you think life is really at, that's where you think you know, like, man, you're working on the outside, right? When people look at me, they think of this. And Jesus is going to say, don't worry about all that stuff. He didn't say it was bad. Not once did he ever say that that was bad. Jesus was able to identify what was holding this man back. He'll look at you and he might call you on something different. But he's going to see where your attachments are. He's going to see all of the places, all of the things that you're grasping and clutching, and he's going to say, cut the cord. That's not where it's at. It's not bad. It's not wrong, but it's holding you back. You can't see God when you're focused on that. Now do that, and then come. And follow me. Cast everything aside, and follow me. I want your undivided attention. And in the story that we read in Matthew the wealthy young man couldn't do it. He couldn't let go. We see his back in Scripture. He walks away because he was unwilling. That was too high a price for him. He would rather try and <laughs> Hold on to a little bit of God, but mostly this. And Jesus said, you gotta let you gotta let go of this so you can wholly have this. And he wouldn't do it. His heart was divided. His heart had become calcified. Soren Kierkegaard, he describes purity as he, he describes purity of heart as willing one thing. When you have a pure heart, you're able to will one thing. And this is the essence of holiness. For our will to be bent towards God, that's, that's, that's holiness. To will one thing, to bend our hearts, to totally lean in on God and away from anything else that we might clutch or grasp. It's to be undivided in our loyalties. And this is a huge challenge for us because we are pulled by the world by our families, by our friends, by our co-workers, by whatever it is that we are watching and being influenced by, we are being pulled in multiple directions. We are being convinced that we need something more than God. And when we go to Jesus, he'll say, no, I am enough. We want God, yes, but we also desire the things of this world. And we want to pursue our own self-interests. And, and so we hang on tightly and we end up getting, we, if you're hanging on to two different things and they're both pulling in a different direction, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be divided. You're going you're to be torn apart. Life will feel um, difficult. It will feel disjointed. It will feel like it's out of focus. It'll feel like you're trying to look through just a little patch of clear snow on your windshield as you're, as you're going through your life. There won't be any peace. Oswald Chambers, I like how he says, to be pure in heart is to be in continued spiritual harmony with God. And a divided heart creates too much noise and distraction. 
and the melody that we're trying to follow in God becomes muted. So our hearts matter a great deal to God. He, he cares about our motivations. And if we're divided, our hearts begin to petrify towards His way and His will. And Jesus did not come into the world simply because we have some bad habits to address. He came into our world to cleanse us from all our sin and all of our unrighteousness. And God's promise in this passage, in multiple places in Scripture, is to give you a new heart of flesh. A soft heart. A responsive heart. A, a pliable heart. One that beats to do the will of God. One that is obedient to what He would have for us. One that is compassionate and caring and loving. A heart that thumps to love mercy and to do justice and to walk humbly with God. And a lot of times the question is, is simply this. Well, how do I, how do I become pure in heart? That's a great question to ask, to think about. And the simple answer is you ask God to do it for you. The harder part of that answer is coming to the end of yourself. And listening to the Spirit and where the Spirit might be telling you to let go of some things that are clouding your vision of God. It's getting to the point where acknowledging, yeah, this is holding me back. I know these thoughts and behaviors, and I know the sin that I've allowed to build up in my life. It's coming to the point where you recognize that and are willing to surrender. Come to the end of yourself and call out to God, I've not been able to do this on my own. I can polish up the outside of my life, you know, and I can have situational purity, okay, but you come to the point knowing that, no, God wants to do a greater work a deeper work, a cleansing work in my life. And so you call out to God to do it for you. And you let Him purify your heart as an act of His grace in response to your faith in Him. You offer yourself completely to Him. See, Jesus died while we were still sinners. You can't clean yourself up enough for God he must do the work for you. Verse 27 in Ezekiel says that God continues to act. He says, I will put my spirit in you and I will move you to follow my decrees. See, what God requires of us, he provides a way. He equips us. He gives us everything that we need. He's given us his Holy Spirit, and so He will purify you from a stubborn, resistant, self-absorbed heart, and, and He will help you to walk consistently in obedience and love to Him. He, he, let Him cleanse you today. That's really where I'm trying to get to, is why wait any longer? Why keep driving down the road in a snowstorm, trying to look through a hole like this, stay on the road. Why continue going through life with this sin stained heart and all of these things that we've put in front of us that are distracting our view of God? And Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they're the ones who will have a vision, will see. God, let him cleanse you today. Call on his name and leave here chasing after him, living life 
with and in the Holy Spirit. Chase after him wherever he might lead you to go. God says, I will sprinkle you with clean water. I will remove that old stone-like heart and give you one like mine. Isn't that amazing? God will give you a heart like his. And instead of loving sin, you can love God with your whole heart. Can we just stand? Let's, let's just close in prayer. As you can imagine, I could keep talking about this. <laughs> in conversations throughout my years as a pastor, this is a big one. This is where a lot of us rest. Is we've, we've allowed our understanding of purity to be degraded over time. And so we just expect less. And I want to tell you there's something greater. God will do all of the work in your life. He will, he will scrub you clean. He will give you what you need to move forward in life and maintain that purity. Does that mean you'll never screw up? No. But when we do and we recognize sin that works its way in, we live a confessional life and we take it to Him. And we receive His grace once again. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for the work that you came to do. That while we were still sinners, you died for us. You shed your blood so that we can be washed clean. So each in our own way, we confess to you this morning, Lord, that maybe we've tolerated more sin in our life than we might have thought. Maybe we have allowed ourselves to be exposed to sin in unhealthy ways. And it, over time, it has begun to change who we are and how we think and how we live. So, Lord, we confess that to you today. We recognize that our lives are stained with sin and we need your purifying grace. Would you cleanse us? We pray, Lord. us and stirring our hearts today. Father, we thank you for this cleansing praise. And we look forward to the ways in which you will call us into the future that you have for us. But as we go back out into this world, having allowed you to do some interior cleaning in our life. Lord, I pray that that would take root and be effective. It will begin to, to change who we are, how we think, how we treat our neighbor, the vocabulary that we choose, how we interact on social media, all of the things that we have to enter back into in life. Lord, I pray that this inner work that you've done in us today would work its way to the outside. And we'll begin even now to, to change those things, to purify them. We live in this world. We look forward to the day that we are in eternity with you, but we recognize that you call us to live as your people in the here and now, so we are not yet out of the world. And so, God, I pray that we would be effective witnesses for you, extending your love and mercy and grace to those we encounter. I pray that we would be a people 
with this cleansing work done that people would look on us and would know that something is different. Lord Jesus, we thank you. And we love you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Next week we'll regather in this place and we'll talk about holiness as power. Have a blessed week.